Chris Godinez, licensed professional counselor, also the host of We Need to Talk on every Sunday here at noon on YouTube, and then I post it up to Facebook. This video is for educational and informational purposes only. If you feel you need a therapist, please go to Google, type in therapy, your city, psychology today will pop up, click on that, and it will have all of the therapists in your area, at least the ones that subscribe to psychology today. Um... The views and opinions stated herein are mine and mine alone. They do not represent the ACA, the APA, or any other damn therapist for that matter. Boom, shakalaka, done. Uh, okay, so uh, India. Hello, India. Wow. Um, okay. Hello, UK. Um, <laughs> which I will be in the UK next June. We've already got the dates planned. If you're interested in attending from the UK, please go to Eventbrite and sign up for that. I will be going to London, Manchester, Edinburgh, and hopefully Dublin. Those those are the places that we are thinking about. Um, okay. Brain gone. Where was I going? Oh, some announcements. Okay. So, uh, Reno is starting to get close to being sold out. So if you are interested in going to Reno, go to Eventbrite, sign up for it there. If we get more than 10 people, then what we'll do is we'll just take a waiting list and then we'll find a bigger place. You know, it's no big deal. So, um, we will do that. Hello, Los Angeles. Hello, Florida. Good Lord, people. You're everywhere. Denver. Wow. Thanks guys. Um, so Reno is getting close to being sold out. So go to Eventbrite, sign up for that. The next one after that is going to be uh, Austin and San Antonio. That one is starting to sell out as well. So if you're interested in going, you're in Texas, you want to see me, that is going to be my only Texas to Texas dates this year. So if you want to go see me in Texas, that is the, that, those are the two places. So uh, there is that. Um, the cruise is still open. We can actually get more cabins until October. So there is that. And actually, I think we can get them after that. So I'll have to, you know, talk to Chris about that. But anyway, so there is that. Um, I have signed up for the walking tour of Nassau. If you guys are interested in coming along with me and John, because I'm a total history buff. And apparently there's a whole bunch of cool old <laughs> houses, <laughs> which I'm very excited about. So anyway, there is that. So the cruise is, I'm so excited about that. The cruise is awesome. I'm just like, yeah, I get to see Victorians and, you know, history and you know, beaches. Can't go wrong with that. So anyway, there is that. Also, I believe the uh, merchant store is still open and uh, you can go get your coffee mugs and stuff there. Can't think of anything else. I believe that is all the uh, announcements. Oh, one little bit of housekeeping. So guys, when you leave me uh, messages and stuff, either in IM or on, on YouTube, and you ask me, well, what specific show, you know, what, where do I go to see this one? I don't have time. I've literally done thousands of videos. So I will have, I have the title in every single one. So if you're looking for a specific topic, look at the titles and it will tell you what I, what I'm talking about that day. So for example, today's topic is toxic shame and how to heal from it, because that is something that we have to deal with when we come out of an abusive relationship. Oh, one little more bit of stuff. Uh, books available on uh, Audible and also available on Amazon. Also, Susanna Quintana's book, You're Still That Girl, is not out on hard copy yet, but it will be. But it is out on Kindle, I believe. Um, so, and you can get a free copy of her book on her SusannaQuintana.com site. Also, Shahida Arabi. Can I tell you how much I love this woman? I love this woman. I love this woman. She's amazing. This book is fantastic. So if you have been raised by narcissistic parents, this is your book to read. Get it, read it, live it, love it. It's awesome. Okay. So diving into the topic today. So toxic shame. So what happens to us is we come out of an abusive relationship, whether that's with a boss or a romantic relationship or a family relationship or whatever. And our brains are going through cognitive dissonance, like crazy, like, wait a minute, you know, left is right, up is down, green is yellow. Everything's wrong. Everything's topsy turvy. What the hell? You know, it's very confusing. And there's a lot of mistaken thoughts and mistaken beliefs that we have about who we are. Why? Because our abusers, whether they were family or not, love to shove their issues into our heads. And then that becomes our internal critic. So toxic shame. So let's, you know, I, I kind of want to expand on 
what I talked about a few weeks ago. A few weeks ago, I was talking about body image and how we are so disconnected from our bodies. Let's take that a step further. Our abusers shame us for our bodies. They do. They, they, they pick on a, a feature of ours and they just go to town go to town and make us feel less than, so one up. So remember, the realm of the abuser is this weird circle, two circles of, you know, too much, not enough, too much, not enough. And somewhere in this very thin little sliver, we're okay on occasion. But more than likely, they tell us that we're in this one or we're in this one. We are very rarely in that little sl thin slice where those two overlap. So they shame us for body image. They shame us for having, you know, a beautiful body. They shame us for having, you know, a good physique. They shame us for having not a good physique. They shame us for, you know, they just shame, 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 shame. And it was really interesting because Jess and I were talking about this the other day and we were talking about how when people really start getting into shape, it's like all of a sudden they've got this huge amount of shame going on, even though they're very proud of their bodies and everything, but there's like this, oh my God, I can't, I can't show it off. I can't, I can't be proud of my own body. Why? Well, because when we were proud of our own bodies, when we were little kids and we had crazy parents that had whatever going on, they were either molesters themselves or they were, you know, religious nuts and, you know, the, oh, the body is evil and bad and wrong and this and that and the other thing. And you weren't supposed to be proud of your body. You were supposed to hate yourself. You were supposed to not like yourself. You were supposed to fill in the blank. So this often happens with really dysfunctional, abusive families is that they shame the child like, okay. Little kids love to round, run around naked. They just do. You know, it's like they just like, ah! you know, and they run around naked. Right. So what happens, though, is, is an abuser will come in and their own uncomfortableness. They will shame that child for not covering up from head to toe. That child then grows up and then has body image issues. Wow. Wonder why. So, you know, and it's not like, you know, you should be running around naked all the time. There's, yeah. But the point being is, though, is that we get this shame about being human. We get this shame about showing off our bodies. We get this shame about whatever. But then let's take this a step further. It's not just about bodies. So what they shame us for is us. So their attacks are so harmful and hurtful because in the beginning, remember, they do the love bomb. Love bomb, love bomb, love bomb. You're perfect. I love you. Oh, look, you like ice cream. I like ice cream. You like moose. I like moose. You like this. I like that. You know, Hans from, you know frozen. So doing this to towards the devalue and the discard phase. Oh, well, why do you say that? Why do you sing like that? Your voice is horrible. You're a terrible person. You're, you know, you, your sense of humor is immature. They're pointing the finger telling you all of this. And really it's coming from their abuser telling them, you know, that they're not enough. And then they flip around and become abusive to us as the abuser. Do you see? It's generational. It's like, if it doesn't get handled, it gets passed on. Yeah. So, uh, you know, okay. Again, I want to make very clear. Narcissists, however, are born without uh, empathy at all, period. So that's not generational. That is genetic. But when you're dealing with the uh, behavior, that is a learned behavior. That shaming is a learned behavior. They've learned that by at the feet of the masters, male or female, doesn't matter. And this is the thing I want to make exceedingly clear. Abusers can be male or female or trans or straight or gay or polyamorous or whatever. Abusers are found in all aspects of the range and in all socioeconomic things. So it's not like you get wealthier and suddenly abuse stops. Oh no, au contraire. Okay. <laughs> so the other way that they shame us is for being independent. So they go after our intellect. They go after our who we are or money. Okay. Let's talk about that. This is an issue that a lot of survivors of abuse have is that they get shamed about money. And this is huge. So think about it. And I've done several videos on this. So let's say you have a toxic family, okay? And there is money involved. What do they do with said money? They dangle it in front of you like a carrot and go, okay, okay, if you just behave, if you just do what I want you to do, you'll get this inheritance. 
can't tell you the number of times I've heard that. My own dad did that. He wrote all of us into and out of his will, into and out of his will, depending on where he was at in his crazy head. So money gets very scrambled in survivors' brains. So what I've seen abusers do to the targets is they will make money bad and wrong and need to be spent as quickly as possible because, oh, that's money is the root of all evil and you shouldn't have it or you should just spend it all on me. <laughs> you see where I'm going with that? So they'll tell you that you have to spend it. But if you try to spend anything on yourself, they will punish you. They will make you wrong. They will put you down. They will tell you what a selfish piece of shit you are, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. They are only happy if you are spending every single penny on them. Oh, and it's evil and it's bad and wrong. So you need to spend it as much as, but don't you dare spend it on yourself. You spend it on me. You take me out to dinners. You take me to big expensive vacations. You take me to a big house. You buy me the biggest house you can. You did it. You don't know money is evil and bad. And we need to spend it. It's crazy. I cannot tell you the number of times I have seen that in abusive relationships and they will tell the target of abuse. You don't get to keep your own money. You have to spend it on me. You have to spend it on me. That's the only way that it's allowed. That's the only way that it's okay. And they will bankrupt their partners doing that because that's part of their evil plan is to bankrupt the target of abuse so that the target of abuse has absolutely no way to leave them. No bueno. So we get this weird connection to money. We get this real shame about having things for ourselves, doing things for ourselves. And this translates into our recovery from domestic violence, from intimate partner violence, from abuse, in that there is so much shame going on, it interferes in the healing process. And what I mean by that is, if we have got a huge amount of toxic shame and we are blaming ourselves, Oh, it was me. It was me. I didn't do enough. I, I should have said this. I could have done that. I would have done that. I should have, you know, if I had just tried harder, if I had just twisted myself into a more of a pretzel and put some salt on top, then maybe they would have loved me. If I had just, it's my fault. Da, da, da. Okay. That's all believing the abuser's bullshit, you know? So what we do is, is that we feel like we are unworthy and we don't deserve it. And we don't deserve happiness because that's what they've been telling us for days, weeks, months, years, decades, you know, and oh my gosh, you don't deserve happiness. You don't deserve that. You're a bad person. You, 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 you. As soon as somebody whips out the you, 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 you guns, I know I'm dealing with an abuser. I absolutely know I'm dealing with an abuser. So, um, so we get this sense of not enough because remember too much, not enough. So you're too emotional. You're too this. You're showing too much skin. You wear too much makeup. Your hair is too this, too that. Your voice is too this, too that. Oh, well, but you don't do enough for me and you should be making more money and you should be taking me out and you should be spending everything you make on me and da, 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 da. Too much, not enough, too much, not enough. So we get into this crazy mindset and it's all our fault. And that's shame. That is toxic shame. That is believing that somehow fundamentally we are broken or wrong Okay. So, and that's what the abuser tells us. I can't tell you the number of times abusers try to use therapists to push their fucking agenda. So they'll call up a therapist, right? And this is how, and I'm just sitting here going, y'all do your research before you fucking dial my number motherfucker. Cause you might want to figure it the fuck out that I don't side with the abusers. So they'll call up and they'll be like, Oh, well now, you know, I'm, you know, I would love to do therapy, you know, couples therapy. And, but I got to tell you my spouse. And then they go off and I'm just like, Mm -hmm. You have just told me everything I need to know. I hope you come in. Ah, you know, I mean, it's just amazing to me. Or they'll set up an appointment for individual therapy for their spouse and then expect to know everything that's going on. And that's the first thing I tell the spouse when they walk in is like, I will not even deny that I'm, I mean, I will not even acknowledge that I'm seeing you. I will have to say, I'm sorry, but due to HIPAA laws, I can neither confirm nor deny that this person is here. Have a nice day. And by have a nice day, I mean, go fuck yourself. So, yeah, so they do this, you know, shaming and putting all of their stuff onto the spouse or onto the kid or whatever. So if they're having sexual issues or body issues or money issues or self-esteem issues, which you can bet your sweet bippy that they are, they put everything onto the target of abuse, whether that's a child, whether that's an employee, whether that's a romantic partner, whatever. Okay, so in, do I have it here with me? No. Damn it. In the CPTSD book, okay, 
in chapter three, he talks about putting the shame and the anger back on to the abuser. Now, if you've got a shit ton of shame, I have got clients that were so horrifically abused emotionally that it is hard for them and multiple, not just one or two. I'm talking a lot that have been really severely mentally traumatized, physically traumatized, but mentally traumatized by an abuser or abusers, that it's hard for them to even open the book. And a lot of people have said that to me. They're like, oh my God, I have the book. I look at the books like all of them, like the self-esteem workbook by Glenn Schiraldi. Yes, I'm going to go through and mention them all again, because you guys need to hear this over and over again. Self-esteem workbook by Glenn Schiraldi, The Disease to Please by Harriet Breaker, um, Object of My Affection by Raquel Lerner, uh, Radical Forgiveness by Colin Tipping, Radical Acceptance by Tara Brock, um, uh, Who's Pulling Your Strings by Harriet Breaker. Um, so they have the books, but there is something inside of them stopping them, like just Full stop, full stop. So they'll make great progress in other areas. You know, oh, uh, the Inner Child Workbook by Katherine Taylor. They'll make great progress in other areas. They'll be able to do like guided meditations. They'll be able to do the, you know, sometimes be able to do the mirror work. But oftentimes what I find is that if they can't even open the books, like they have all the books and they want to read them and they're, you know, they're right there. They often have a hard time also looking in the mirror. So this all goes back to self-esteem all of it. So let's go a little deeper. How do we fix this? How do we fix this? So we fix this by telling your therapist that you're having a hard time reading the books. <laughs> Number one, if you don't tell your therapist, your therapist is not going to know. We're not mind readers. I wish that we were. It would make things so much easier, but we're not. So you got to tell your therapist, hey, I'm struggling. I, I can't even read the books. Okay, well, how's the mirror work doing? Well, okay, I, um, when I look in the mirror, I hear my internal critic. And that's oftentimes what's happening is that the shame factor from the abuse, from the abuser has been so great that it is overpowering you and your ability to say, hi, good to see you. Have a wonderful day. I give you permission to think that you're okay. See where I'm going with that? It's overpowering that. It is so much that it's not even allowing you to challenge the abuser. Now, I want to also point out that anniversaries are hugely important. If there is a parent, a parental unit that was abusive, okay, and you're an adult and they're dead, okay, they're gone, Huzzah! but their birthday comes up or their wedding anniversary comes up or something comes up, the anniversary of when you stopped talking to them or whatever, you're going to have a reaction to that. You're going to regress a little bit. This is what happens with grief, guys. This is what happens with abuse. And this is all part of the toxic shame. So when we have an abuser that has been you know, you're bad, you're wrong, you're this, you, 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 you know, you're too loud, you're too soft, you're too much, you're not enough, you know, this whole thing, and we've got all this toxic shame going on, it is really hard to work on ourselves. And there is a great deal of fear. And there is a great deal of anger. So in some cases, it is the fear that is putting the brakes on full stop. It's like, oh, there's all this shame. Oh my God, it's too much. It's too overwhelming. I don't want to do it. I, I'm scared. Valid, you know, because we're having to reopen. Well, actually they never healed. So we're having to take a look at the wounds that are still leaking. Okay. And that's what people don't understand. So they think that they think in their minds, you know, the little kids running the show, the inner child is running the show at this point. The little kids inner child thinks if the monster, if I can't see the monster, then the monster can't see me. So if I just sweep all of this shame, all of this hurt, all of this anger under the rug and never deal with it, it is gone. No, wrong, e incorrect response. All that is going to do is make you emotionally constipated. Trust me on this one. So the anger and the shame and everything starts getting shoved down, shoved down, shoved down, shoved down, shoved down. And the next thing you know, you are acting out unconsciously on the very people who love you, who are trying to help you. And you're being mean, vicious, horrible, awful, nasty, and little mini abuser to them because you're acting out your abuse because it's unconscious because that's what kids do. So, hmm. 
what you got to do is you've got to be willing to take a look at the abuse. You've got to be willing to see the leaking wounds that we have, the original wounds that we have that are just still, you know, leaking and pussy and pus filled and, and, you know, gang green in some cases. And you've got to be willing to feel it, to heal it. So this is something else I hear from survivors of abuse is that they're like, I don't want to feel, I don't want to feel, I don't want to feel. And then I look at them and I go, well, what are you doing all the time anyway? Feeling? Yes. Yes. That is exactly what's happening. And those feelings are yucky. Those are yucky feelings because all you're thinking about somehow, some way subconsciously is the abuse. So you got to, you got to take this, you got to grab the bull by the horns. My favorite saying in the world, in the world, this is my favorite saying, well, besides motherfucker, my favorite saying in the world is, is you grab that bull by the horns, you wrench its neck, you take it down, you skin it, you tan its hide, you barbecue its meat and you use its bones for soup and you be done with that bitch. Bam. Done. If you don't, the ghost of that buffalo is going to be coming after you forever. Trust me on this one. You have to take the bull by the horns. You have to take its neck, wrench it, bring it down. I know this is very graphic, but you know, and I'm sorry for the vegetarians out there. So you have to take the asparagus by its head, wrench it, bring it down, parboil it, do what you need to. Get her done. Okay. Get her done. You got to. Because if you don't, it's just going to keep coming back bigger and badder. So when we resist something, when we resist dealing with the shame, when we resist dealing with the anger, that's another thing that people feel is not just the fear. So fear is a lot of what stops people. Another thing that happens is, and this is what I've heard oftentimes from people who've had a deep amount of shame shoved into their space. I'm afraid, this goes back to fear, that if I get angry, I will never stop. Valid point. You got a lot to be angry about. You do. So here's the thing. Anger is a good thing. There is a great book called The Gift of Anger. I have no clue who wrote it. It's called The Gift of Anger. And it's really about how anger just shows us where we have been hurt and what we need to work on. Anger is a valuable emotion. It is not a futile emotion. I love how, you know, I don't, when I say love, I mean the polar opposite. I love how when abusers are abusing us and we get angry, oh, well, you know, Anger is a futile emotion, you know, like, like we're not allowed our anger. Like it's not okay for us to be like, you hurt me. I am angry. Fuck you. See where I'm going with that? So anger is a good emotion as long as it is conscious. If it is not conscious, you will harm people around you. Okay. You've got to be conscious about it. If you are angry at your abuser, this is when you get a punching bag or a gym with a punching bag and you wail on that bitch. Okay, to get to the softer emotions underneath. Anger is the bodyguard of the more vulnerable emotions. Anger is the bodyguard of the more vulnerable emotions, such as fear, hurt, sadness. And when we're with an abuser, we can't show fear, we can't show hurt, and we can't show sadness. Why? Because they will abuse the shit out of us. They will go for the jugular. They will go, ah, oh, you're vulnerable. Oh, well, mm -hmm, mm, I'm enjoying it. Yes. So, you know, this is why I didn't cry until I left the house. I did not. And it's still, to this day, it's very hard for me to cry. So when I'm crying in front of you guys, that is like, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm okay. I'm safe. I can do this. Okay. It's still hard for me to do because I was told, I'll give you something to cry about. You're just a little pussy. You're a little this. You're a little that. You're you're weak. You're you know da 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 da. Uh 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 uh. <laughs> Au contraire. People who are in touch with their emotions are the strongest people I know, because they have more flexibility and they have more ability to move up, down, sideways, lateral, whatever that they need to in life. Whereas abusers are very rigid and cannot flow. They don't flow. They don't. There's no flow there. So okay. So um. So healing this means getting in touch with your emotions, okay? You got to feel it to heal it. You just got to. You have to figure out, what am I thinking? What am I feeling? Why am I sabotaging myself with shame that's not even mine? Why am I not putting it back on the abuser? Why am I allowing the anger or the fear to stop me? So in some cases, what's happening is, is that that little inner child again 
How many times did we get told, don't you tell? How many times did we get told, this is our little secret? Depending on what kind of abuse it was. I, in my family, it was very much a, you are not to tell anyone what your dad is doing. Not that he's hit you, not that he's tried to stick his tongue down your throat, nothing. You are to tell them nothing. And of course I told anyone who would listen because it's like, oh yeah, watch this. <laughs> so the point being is, how many times have we been told to shut up? How many times have we been told, don't you tell on the abuser? So when we start to work on ourselves and acknowledge what the abuser did, we are going absolutely in the opposite direction of what our abusers have been programming us our entire lives. And romantic partners do the same thing. Romantic partners do the same thing. Why do you think that they don't want us to have friends? Why do you think that they isolate us? Why do you think that they try to get us to stop talking to our family? Because they don't want us to tell. They don't want us to say, this is what's going on. And for somebody healthy and normal to go, whoa, red flag, what penalty on the play, five yards, what the fuck? Do you see where I'm going with that? So yeah, this is, this is why when we get up to starting to work on ourselves, this thing goes to town and it tells us lies just like our abuser would. And it's our little, little inner child. So we have to comfort our inner child and let them know it's safe. It's okay. It's all right for you to work on yourself. It's okay for you to work on yourself. You must work on yourself. Why? Because you want to heal. You don't want this wound the rest of your life. You don't. You don't need to be an oozing opened wound for some other abuser to just march in and be like, oh, I see that wound. Ah, I know how to play that. And that's what they do. They absolutely do. Even though you think you've got it hidden, you don't. So something that I am finding that is helpful when it is difficult to do the work is you either get the audio book so that you're hearing it, do it a chapter at a time, and then go back to the workbook and then reread so that you're getting a double whammy. So you're getting an audio version of it and you're getting the, the reading of it. Okay. And I know reading is not everybody's thing. So the audio versions are good enough. Good enough. Just do it. You know, you got to do something. The other thing is too, is with the mirror work, you give yourself permission. It's okay for me to heal. And you can just say that without the mirror. You can just, you know what? It's okay for me to heal. You know what abuser? It's okay for me to heal. Journal, write them a letter, write them a letter, write your abuser a letter. Dear abuser, Fuck the fuckity fuck fuck out of fucking fuck you, asshole. I am going to heal. I do have a right to be happy. I am a good person. I, I am, I am, I am good enough. And fuck anyone who says otherwise. Yeah, that's what we got. We got to get mad, guys. We got to get mad. If you do not get to the point where you are mad at your abuser, you are allowing your abuser to be in your head and to continue to abuse you. You have got to evict them unceremoniously. Like, okay, motherfucker, here we go. Here's what you did. You did this. You did it in the beginning. You love bomb. You told me how fabulous I was. You know, you were this, that, and the other thing. We did all these great things together and blah, blah, blah. Then we get down towards the devalue and the discard, but then it wasn't enough. I wasn't enough for you. And so you started telling me that it was my fault. And although I had not changed, you did. And it's me, it's me, it's me, it's me. Guess what? It was you. Sorry, not playing. Have a nice fucking day. Go fuck yourself sideways with an unlubricated baseball bat. I am evicting you out of my head. You do not get to live in my space. One second more. Why? I got bigger and better things to do, motherfucker. Like heal myself. Like go be happy. Like have a life. Like start, you know, loving me. Really. You're not welcome. You're not welcome. Bye bye. And then you trot it out to the barbecue, you read it out loud once, and you burn it. So anything you are feeling shame about, I want you to write it down. Where did you learn this? And I love it when my clients go, oh, well, I've always thought this way. I'm like, okay, babies do not pop out of the womb feeling shame. That is a learned behavior. Learned. That is not something we naturally normally do. Guilt, shame, obligation, fear are all learned behaviors from abusers. So if you're feeling guilt or shame or fear or obligation, write it out. Where did you learn this from? Who taught you? Who taught you to be ashamed of your body? Who taught you to be ashamed of your intelligence? Who taught you to be ashamed of the way you manage money or making you wrong or whatever? 
So do you see where I'm going with this? So you write it out and you put it back on the abuser. Do not buy the bullshit of, oh, it's you, it's you, it's you. You know, yeah, they're right. It was me. No, uh uh-uh, wrong. The shame, mm mm-mm. That's coming from them. And don't sweep it under the rug. All you're going to get is a lumpy rug and you're not going to be able to vacuum it or clean it very well. You know, so that's that. So, okay. So in order to heal from this, you have to put it back on the abuser. I really strongly recommend getting the CPTSD from Surviving to Thriving by Pete Walker. In the chapter three, I believe it goes over the anger and the shame and putting it back on the abuser. If you were having a hard time opening the book, then get it on Audible. Listen to it. Now, I understand people have been telling me that the person who reads uh, the CPTSD book has the personality of a cardboard box. So you just kind of got to take it for what it is. Not every author is able to get a good reader. That's why I prefer doing my own because A, I'm trained as an actress and B, it's like it's my own words and I know what I'm saying. So, you know, you want to do the Audible And then you want to go back to the workbook and start working the workbook. Okay. And as far as the mirror work is concerned, you're going to have to start working with yourself without the mirror. So in the morning, when you wake up, gratitude, 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 gratitude. And then you start doing positive affirmations for yourself. So one of the things I hear too, oh God, running out of time and I need to do this. One of the things I hear from uh, abuse survivors is I'm not likable. Well, where the fuck did you learn that from? No, you're immensely likable. Oh my God, are you likable? Holy shit, people like you. Oh God, I sounded like Sally Fields. Anyway, the point being is, is that our abusers love to make us wrong for being likable. And they tell us we're not. And how dare us for being likable? Well, everybody just likes you, don't they? Like, that's a bad thing. But they do that because they want to undermine our self-esteem. So you got to start working on positive self esteem. Okay. You got to do it. If you can't do it in front of the mirror, you just start saying it. It's like, I am likable. I am. I am is a very powerful statement. I am likable. No, I am not going to go for your toxic shame. Fuck you. You know, you write and burn letters. You do that multiple times. You get the audible, you listen to the first chapter, then you do the workbook, the first chapter, and then you go back and listen to the second chapter, and then you do the workbook, second chapter. If that's what it takes, do it. And if you need help from the therapist, for the love of God and all that is holy, speak up, because we're not going to know if you don't tell us. So if we need to, then we'll just say, okay, great, let me bring in the book, and we'll go through it together. If that's what you need, then that is what I will do. That's what a good therapist does. That's what a good mom does. So anyway, just went off on a tangent. All right, let's go to, where am I? Let's go to questions. Okay, hang on. Boop. Gotta get that. Okay. My ex-boyfriend used to shame me for my body relentlessly. I left him seven years ago and have had several relationships since. Yet I can't shame shed the body shame no matter how much I try. How do I overcome this? All right. All right. So, um, basically what it is, is you write him a letter, you put it back on him. It's like, and, and you take, you love yourself in the mirror. This is what I suggest people, especially if the abuser like shamed you for your body or, you know, my parents did the whole, don't you show your belly. Don't you show your belly. I don't know what their issue with the belly was. I don't know if it was a sexual thing or if it was just the, you know, fundamentalist religious thing or what. So when I first started wearing uh, a bikini, because I wear them now, you know, I was like, oh my God, I can't, I need to cover up. I need to da, 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 da. And John was like, no, 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 you don't. Because you know what? Your dad is not here. Your mom is not here. I like it when you wear bikinis. It's okay. And so that was huge. That was very helpful. But the other thing that I did too, is that I would stand in front of the mirror naked and I would love my body. I would go, you know what? I love your hair. I love your hair. I love your nose. I love your lips. I love your neck. I love your boobs. I love your body. I love your belly. I love your this, your hips. I love your thighs. And you just go through it. Same thing for men. Same thing. Do it. (laughs) Love yourself in the mirror, kinky. Thank you, Chris. But it's, it's reparenting yourself because a good parent does not shame their child. A good parent says, yeah, you've got a beautiful body. Congratulations. Unfortunately, society suggests that we cover up. So here's a teacher. You know, I mean, you don't ever shame them like they're a bad 
little one for wanting to run around free, you know? Um, okay. Uh, I hope that answered the question. So you, you really work on self-esteem, the self-esteem workbook by Glenn Chiraldi. I would strongly suggest getting with a therapist, strongly suggest and working on where did this hooked into something. So when they body shame us, if we really know who we are, we won't necessarily always fall for every single shame that they throw at us. But the ones that stick, there's something going on that we maybe had some priming or some grooming with that in the past. So who else body shamed you? Write it out. Journal it. Get it out of your head. Get it on the paper. Trot it out to the barbecue. Read it out loud once. Burn it. Get with a therapist. Try to figure out if there is anything else going on. If there's not, cool and groovy. You can work on your, your ex. So... All right. Um, all right. I believe I have some symptoms of antisocial personality disorder and told my therapist I felt this way. They said somebody with ASPD would not openly say they have ASPD. What are your thoughts? Well, here's the thing. Antisocial personality disorder means that they feel the rules do not apply to them. You can have traits of for sure. Um, and, or you could be full blown. Unfortunately, antisocial personality disorder. Um, could they say that they felt that they were antisocial? Yeah, they could, they could, they could recognize that there's something abnormal going on. If you are that concerned about it, I would strongly suggest getting a psych eval, go make an appointment with a psychiatrist and get a psychology, psych, psychological evaluation. And they'll ask you a bunch of questions. Let's think it's something like 600 questions or something. And they'll talk to you and they'll do a psych eval. So if that is what you are concerned about, then do that. So here's the thing. Not all therapists believe in diagnosing. Not all therapists believe in quote unquote labeling because they're humanists. I have zero respect for them. Um, so, but in what I find is, is that if the, if the client knows what they're dealing with, then they can work on it. If the therapist just is like, oh, you get a prize for showing up and never tells the client what's going on, then the client's not going to know what to work on. So if you are concerned about that, go get a psych eval. And I can't tell just by reading this question whether you are or you weren't. Because unfortunately, some people, not all, but some people with ASPD, especially when they're further down, um, can be complete and total, you know, no, no empathy, no whatever. And you know, manipulative, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So go get a psych eval, find out what's going on and then work on it from there. And uh, that's my suggestion for that question. Is it common for people to gaslight you and target your shame as a form of control? Let's clarify that. It is common for abusers to gaslight you and target your shame as a form of control. That is what abusers do. That is abso freaking lutely what abusers do. Normal, quote unquote, bunny ears, healthy people do not gaslight. What is gaslighting? Gaslighting is lying. Gaslighting is rewriting history. Gaslighting is not taking responsibility for what you know you have done and everybody else knows you have done. It is putting, shaming, blaming, guilt tripping, putting it off on somebody else. That's gaslighting. That's rewriting history. That is lying. Okay. Healthy people do not lie. Now, white lies, you betcha. So like if your best friend walks up to you and go, do these tins make me look fat? You're not going to be like, oh my God, you look like a heifer. No, you're not going to do that. What you're going to do is, you know, I kind of like the other jeans better. Which is kind of like lying by omission, but you're doing it to spare somebody's feelings. So it depends on what the intent is. With the gaslighters, their intent is to manipulate, control, harm, put down, shame, blame, guilt trip, make them feel obligated, instill fear. I hope that explains the difference. Okay, what is the next question here? Hang on. Um, do, 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 do. Oh, this darn thing. Okay. Um, okay, so, all right. Is it common to wake up feeling what is it? Is it common to wake up feeling like you've had a panic attack in your sleep? Yes. Okay. So let's talk about that. When we have had an abuser that is incredibly abusive. Okay. And they have shamed us, blamed us, guilt tripped us, everything else. What happens is, is our brain is trying to process us and this for us. And what happens when we have 
night terrors or panic attacks in our sleep is we've had a dream about them or we're replaying something that's happened. We may not always remember. Sometimes the dreams are very vivid though. When you've got CPTSD, sometimes the dreams are very, very vivid and you remember stuff. But other times the dreams are fleeting and you don't remember them, but you just wake up with that sense like you've been running really fast or your heart is pounding out of your chest or whatever. Those are all part of PTSD. So it's our brain trying to process the trauma and make it okay. Does that make sense? So, okay. Um, what can you do for that? So I suggest keeping a dream journal by your bed. When you wake up, immediately start writing. What am I feeling? What am I smelling? What am I hearing? What am I tasting? What's going on? What was the dream about? What was I dreaming about? Okay. Try to write it down. If you can remember, if you cannot, what was the feeling? What did it feel like? Did it feel familiar? Did it feel like somebody you knew? Did it feel, you know, what was going, you know, what was the fear? What's the fear? Were you being chased in your dream? Were you being screamed at in your dream? Try to write as much of it down as you possibly can. That's going to help you start kind of figuring out what's going on. One thing that you can do to combat that seriously is again, mirror work. So in the evening, instead of saying, hi, good to see you, you're going to say, hey, good to see you again. I give you permission to sleep well, you're safe, you're protected, it's okay, sleep well, and then go to bed. What are you doing? You're priming your subconscious, just like you do in the morning when you say, hey, have a great day. You're priming your subconscious to have a good night. I give you a good night, sleep well, dream well, have good dreams. It's okay, you're safe, and then go to bed. So your subconscious is now thinking, oh, I'm safe, I'm okay, everything's fine, oh gosh, okay, I'm gonna go to sleep. And then your dreams will start getting better because you've been telling yourself, I give myself permission to dream happy dreams. You can say that. Hey, hi, good to see you again. Three things you did right. You list them off. Hey, I give you permission to sleep well and to dream happy dreams. Have a great night and then go to bed. And you do that and it will change. It's just like when people, you know, come to me and they're like, no, 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 I don't want to do the mirror. It's stupid, blah, blah, blah. And then they go do it and they're like, oh, this actually works. And I'm like, Yes, it does. And so does doing it at night because you're doing the same thing except for your subconscious. So yes, absolutely. Okay. Um, blah, 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 blah. Where is the next question? There it is. Uh, can somebody with CPTSD who has been living with a malignant narcissist for 50 plus years also exhibit narcissistic traits? Yes. Okay. So what is happening is called fleas. The longer you stay with an abuser, and especially if the abuser is one that never leaves your side, never allows you to go see family or friends, constantly isolates you, insists on being enmeshed with you so that you don't do anything without them except work and home, work and home, work and home, you are going to pick up their behavior like a motherfucker. Seriously hang on. So what is going to happen is you are going to be, you're going to be with them and they will have behaviors and abusers demand that we behave like they do. That is just what abusers do. They want a mini me. They want everyone to reflect back to them. This is why abusers, especially narcissists need, I think it's called sycophants. They need people, yes men, yes women and yes men, to reflect back to them at all times the very things that they are doing. So if they are evil, mean, harmful, hurtful, et cetera, they want somebody that's going to be doing the same thing surrounding them. These are their flying monkeys. Hello. And so they want people to act just like them. And so what they will do is they will take a target of abuse who's got a good heart, who's kind, who's gentle, who's intelligent, who's funny, who's sweet, who's, you know, whatever, and they will torture that person until they are no longer recognizable and have now become the abuser. Because we learn very quickly, if we don't act like the abuser, we get abused. So it's called picking up fleas. In that case, I don't know if there's any coming back from that, depending on how much damage they've done. In some cases, the targets of abuse adopt the snarkiness, adopt the nastiness, adopt the harming, adopt the throwing people under the bus, you know, abandoning their own children, abandoning their family, abandoning their friends, and they think there's nothing wrong with this worldview. I don't know if you can come back from that. 
I don't. Um, if you are aware that you have picked up fleas, then yeah, you can come back from it. But if you don't acknowledge there's a problem, <laughs> there's nothing you can do. See where I'm going with that? Um, it's, it's like being an alcoholic. You can't get better unless you acknowledge there's a problem. You know, it's like if you're just like, no, no, everything's fine. I've got 10 DUIs and I've run people over. No, everything's fine. You know, you're never going to get better. But if you go, shit, I have picked up narcissistic fleas. I don't want this. Then guess what? You can fix it. Just like an alcoholic going, I got a problem. I need to get clean and sober. Just exactly like that. Because we are addicted to our abuser, not the abuse, the abuser. And we do the same thing that addicts do. We either go into denial or we go into the absolute rock bottom and we go, shit, this needs to be fixed. So there that is. Um, blah, 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 blah. I hope that answered the question. Yes, you can pick up fleas. Yeah, you can exhibit narcissistic traits. It depends on whether or not you're willing to work on them or not. So like when my dad died, my mom was a pretty miserable person up until that point. It was really hard being with her because she was sabotaging and she had her own issues and her mother was a narcissist and whoo, all sorts of stuff. She picked up a lot of my dad's bad behavior. She picked up a lot of my grandmother's bad behavior. When they both died, mom pulled her head out of her ass and was like, I don't like this. I don't want to live like this. And she started asking a shit ton of questions. You know, if you read, if you read my book, I talk about it. So, you know, you can fix it. You can change. And it just depends on your willingness to confront the pain, the shame, the guilt tripping, the fear, the anger. You got to confront it. You got to feel it to heal it, people. You got to feel it to heal it. Okay. My borderline um, personality disordered girlfriend resented me for not being physical with her after the passing of my previous girlfriend. How do I stop feeling like I deserve the abuse she's giving me for this? Moment. I must process this. Wait. So my current girlfriend, who has borderline personality disorder, resented me for not being physical with her after the passing. So your previous girlfriend died, if I'm reading that right. How do I stop feeling like I deserve the abuse she's giving me for this? Um, sex is not, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, abusers have a tendency to think of sex as being deserved or as being expected or um, sense of entitlement. Sex is consensual. If one person is not in the mood because of a death occurring, then you're not in the mood, period. And that other person has to respect that. And if they do not respect that, that is not a healthy relationship. So um, you want to be very careful about that. Now, how do I stop feeling like I deserve the abuse she's giving me for this? You need to go to a therapist and work on your self-esteem. You need to figure out why you're in a relationship where you feel you deserve to be told you're bad and wrong for drawing a boundary. So Self-Esteem Workbook by Glenn Schiraldi, The Disease to Please by Harriet Breaker, uh, Stop Walking on Eggshells by Randy Krieger, which will help you say no to uh, somebody with borderline personality disorder. Um, that's abuse and that's not okay. And you don't deserve that. And you have a right to say no to sex if you don't want sex. Anybody has the right to say no to sex if they don't want sex. Abusers are the ones who push it. And abusers are the ones who, if you do not give it, will sit there and make you wrong, make you wrong, make you wrong, make you wrong. So speaking of shaming, oftentimes what abusers will do is they will start calling into question the person's sexuality. So if, for example, the person doesn't want to have sex with the abuser, they'll start telling them that they're gay or they'll start telling them that they're not good enough in bed and they can't please them. And it's, you know, it's you, 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 guns. Hello. And then they will start humiliating them outside of the relationship to people outside. Well, you know, so-and-so just can't please me. Well, you know, I honestly think he or she is gay, blah, blah. It, <laughs> Hello. You said no to sex. That's a right. You have a right to say no to sex. You don't have to have sex with your partner if you don't want to. And if they're making you wrong for it and abusing you for it, get the fuck out of that relationship. That is not healthy. What the fuck? Do you see where I'm going with that? All right. So my sister is, wait a minute. Nope. There's another one before that. Whoa. Where did I go? Okay. I just realized how scared I am for my affections to be rejected. How? What causes this? Well, nobody likes to be rejected. Nobody. It, nobody likes to be rejected. It feels yucky. It does. But you know what? A person with healthy self-esteem goes, hey, you know what? Not everybody's going to like me. Okay. You know, I can't, I can't force them. And you move on. So the fear is that feeling. 
So it's, it never feels good to be rejected. It doesn't, it doesn't feel good to have mean things said to you ever, you know? And so what we tend to do is we have this fear about it. It's like, Oh my God, what if, what if, okay, well, yeah, they could reject you, but what if they don't, what if, what if they accept you, you know? And the, what if, keeps us from living. It's like, it's avoidance. It's avoidance. So it's like we allow the fear to run what we are doing and to run how we are in the world as opposed to, excuse me, as opposed to going, okay, yeah, it could happen. Yeah. And, you know, it's not like they've threatened to kill us. They've just said no, you know? So you got to get over that fear and you got to work on self-esteem. People with good self-esteem are not afraid of rejection. They don't particularly enjoy it unless they're masochists, but you know, it's like, you're not afraid of it. It's like it, rejection is a part of life. It's gonna happen. It is, you know? So, you know, I took my first book to an attorney here in town and had him read it to make sure I wasn't going to get sued. And oh my God, he was a narcissist and he came unhinged when he read my book and started telling me I was all sorts of things. Now, if I had been less secure in my self-esteem, I never would have published. But instead, what I went was, oh, <laughs> I touched a nerve with that book. Hmm, guess I got to publish. See where I'm going with that? It's like you consider the source and you decide whether it's somebody you really need to be listening to or not. If you do not have that self-esteem, that healthy voice in your head, you're going to believe every nasty thing that people tell you. You know, um, so you're afraid of it because nobody likes that. So work on self-esteem. It really, I swear to God, I've been telling you guys this for years and I'm not kidding. It really does all boil down to do you love yourself? Like really not just, oh, I'm, I'm feeding myself chocolates and uh, taking hot baths kind of self-care. Are you changing your life so that you're living a life that you do not need to run away from? That's self-love. All right. My sister is schizoaffective. She's gone no contact with me. My parents did it for years at a time. When she comes back, I don't want to take her back. Am I wrong to do this? No, you are not. So here's the deal. If you were not related to this person, would you have any thing to do with them? If the answer is no, then act accordingly. We do not owe family or blood anything. We don't. If they treat us like doo-doo, they are not allowed in our lives. Period. Just like anybody else. Just like anybody else. Okay? You're not wrong for that. Um, how do I deal with people who say, he's your dad, and why don't you just try harder? <laughs> do you want the Chris answer, or do you want the uh, really uh, non-nuclear answer? Um, these people make me feel shame for not trying harder with my narcissistic dad. Again, these people do not understand narcissistic abuse and or they are flying monkeys and or they are uh, uh, abusers themselves. So the Chris answer is how the fuck dare you tell me how to deal with an abusive piece of shit parent? That's the nuclear answer. The non-nuclear answer is no response at all. No response at all. You know, it's, it, you know, it's like these people are interfering in your business. They have no right to do so, whether they are family or not. You treat them as flying monkeys. You know, how dare they? How dare they? How fucking dare they? I mean, you could even say that and then go no contact. Um, because here's the thing. No matter how hard you try, the abuser is never going to change. They're never going to get better. They're never going to grow. They're never going to have a V8 moment, you know, oh my God, I've been an ass. I should have changed. I should have treated you better, blah, blah, unless they're on their deathbed. And that's usually when they have to come to Jesus moment. <gasps> I'm dying and I need to make amends because I need to get into heaven and not hell. Good luck with that. So, I mean, do you see where I'm going with that? So they don't change. They don't change. And it's really nobody's business how you conduct your relationships. It's none of their business. It isn't. So you can do the nuclear one. You can tell them to saw it off and then go absolutely no contact with them. Or you can just no contact. That's actually the better one. Because if you tell them to go fuck themselves, then they'll be like, oh, so-and-so told me to go fuck myself. Oh, what a horrible person. And then yeah, you've got drama. Okay. So, um, just do the, do the no contact. 
do the no con. How dare they? And just, you know, note it to yourself, write and burn a letter, let it go. You didn't, they, they are not worth your precious time, sweetheart. We are only allotted a certain amount of time on this planet. And the less time you spend it on these fucking assholes, the happier you'll be. All right. So um, I have supervised visits. Horrible. I did not have an, a lawyer. He and supervised sinner is body shaming my seven-year-old. How can I help her? What are some things I can tell her at that age? Well, you keep reaffirming that she is beautiful. Dress her appropriately so that, you know, they don't have an excuse to do body shaming. You know, I'm not saying dress her like, you know, an Amish person, but, you know, dress appropriately. And um, you, you find some books on Amazon that are self-esteem for children. And I know they're out there. I have not looked because I don't work with kids. I work with adults and teens. So, um, or young adults kind of thing. So, um, Go on to Amazon, look for self-esteem books for, for seven-year-olds, you know, look for things that help them with body image then. So that should be okay. Um, document everything and you may want to revisit with a lawyer custody. So uh, is it possible to have just, uh, is it possible to just have anger management issues and not be an ab abusive person? Are you harming people while you're doing it? That's abuse. Now, that's not to say that you are abuser, like in the typical narcissistic abuser type of thing. But if you're having anger management issues and you're harming people, that needs to be addressed. That's abuse. You know, that may not be your stereotypical uh, narcissistic abuse kind of thing. But when we are having anger management and we act out because of the inner child, because of abuse from, you know, original wound, mom, dad, whatever, and we're harming people, that's abusive. We got to own it. We got to own it. We got to, got to own it. When I was drinking, I was the angriest person on the face of the fucking planet. And I said some pretty fucking horrible things and I've made amends for it. You have to, you know, you take ownership, you take responsibility, you work on it. Was that abusive? You bet your sweet fucking ass it was. So you take, a, you take personal responsibility for the way you were behaving. Does that make you a narcissist? No. The five Five out of the nine criteria make you a narcissist. Do you see where I'm going with that? But can you be abusive and not be a quote unquote narcissist? Yeah, absolutely. If you're an alcoholic and you're throws of alcohol or drug addiction and you're taking out your anger on everybody, that's abuse. Absolutely. So um, yeah, the answer to that question is yes. The, also the answer to that question is you go work on the anger management. What is driving the anger? Anger is not a pure emotion. All of the other emotions are pure. Love is love. Lust is lust. Happy is happy. Sad is sad. Anger always driven by fear. Remember, anger is the bodyguard of the softer emotions and it's driven by fear. It's driven by the fear of being hurt, the fear of being made fun of, the fear of being found out, you know, whatever, you know, the imposter syndrome kind of thing. Anger is driven by some fear. So what's the fear? What are you afraid of? What is driving your anger? What's underneath it? That's what you got to find out. And once you start finding that out, you start working on it. And once you start working on it, you go start making amends to the people that you've used your anger on. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, my dad still won't take accountability for his actions. My family thinks he's done no wrong. His supply is the sympathy he gets from everyone because I went no contact. I'm in therapy. How can I move on without his accountability? This is a sticky wicket for almost every survivor of abuse. So your abuser is never going to own up to what they did, ever. You are going to have to learn to live with the apology that you never received. It's not about them anymore, guys. It's not. It's about us. It's about what are we doing in this moment? How are we living our fullest life in this moment forward? So anger, resentment, that is like picking up two hot coals intending to throw them at somebody else and we are the only ones getting burnt. So that is the same thing. It's like, well, but I want an apology. Well, of course you do. Of course, we all want an apology from our abusers. Trust me on that. It would help. It would, but it's never gonna happen. They are never going to go, oh, geez, you know, I was a real asshole and I need to make amends for what I did. They're never going to do that unless it was being driven by alcohol and it was the alcohol that was causing that. Then yes, they can get clean and sober. They can make amends. They can, you know, clean up their act. 
If they are narcissists, however, and they meet five of the nine criteria, or they are malignant borderlines, again, meeting five of the nine criteria, and they are actively harming people and actively enjoying it, and they're doing the whole, oh, I'm a victim, I'm a victim, I'm a victim, which is covert narcissism, or hermit, BPD, then they are never going to change. They are never going to change. They are never going to have that uh, epiphany moment where they're like, oh my God, I fucked up, I need, unless they're on their deathbeds. So um, how can you move on without his accountability? You know what he did. God knows what he did. The universe knows what he did. Good enough. Good enough. You start living with that. And you write and burn a go fuck you letter to him. Dear dad, you did this, 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 this. I can't say anything nice about you. You know, sometimes you can, sometimes you can't. And at the very end of the letter, you evict them. You're never going to take responsibility for what you did. You're never going to acknowledge that you threw me under the bus. You're never going to acknowledge that you abused me. You're never going to acknowledge that you whatever happened. So you know what? Fuck the fuckity fuck fuck out of fucking fuck you, asshole. I am evicting you out of my head. You are not allowed to live in here one second more. Go fuck yourself. Have a nice life. I don't need your fucking apology. I just need you to drop dead. Have a nice day. And then you take it out to the barbecue and you burn it. Let it go. They're never going to change. You're never going to get that apology. And you're just going to have to go, okay, I'm never going to get the apology. There's never going to be any acknowledgement that what I went through. And you just kind of have to live with it. You do. You, it's like you accept. You accept. So it's called Radical Acceptance by Tara Brock. It's accepting what is. And what is, is that they will never apologize. They will never change. They will never grow. They will never realize that they were harmful, hurtful, abusive, whatever. And you've got to learn to live with the apology that you will never receive. And you let it go. Do not allow them to live in your head one second more. Go live your life to the absolute fullest. Filled with love. Filled with joy filled with happiness, and at some point, forgiveness. So when we work on forgiveness, and I can hear a whole bunch of people going, I'm never going to forgive them. Okay, take a deep breath. Calm down. It's not about them. It's about us. So when we forgive, we forgive for us. It's like, you know what? You are who you are. This is how you're acting. I cannot change it. I choose to forgive. That does not mean I choose to allow it to continue to happen. So idiot compassion versus compassion. Idiot compassion, and this is a Pima Chodron thing. She's the American Buddhist nun. Idiot compassion is where somebody goes, oh, I forgive you. And then they let them come back into their life and abuse them over and over and over again. That's idiot compassion. You're not going to fix them by allowing them to keep coming back. Compassion compassion is where you go, hmm, okay. I've worked on myself. I understand how I got groomed for all of this. I got it. I understand where my where my vulnerability was to let this person in. I got it. I see how they were raised. Okay. I see that they're an abuser. I've educated myself on narcissistic abuse. Okay. I understand everything they're doing. Ah, okay. No empathy. Wow. It sucks to be you, dude. Or do dad. I forgive you. And? You let him go. They don't get to live rent-free in your head anymore. They're not a part of your life. You move on. You live your best authentic life in the moment. In the moment. Hard to do. Not going to lie to you. And it may take some time and it may take several letter writings to get this through. But you have to let them go. Otherwise, what we do is subconsciously, we stay angry at the abuser, keeping them alive in our head in an effort to heal them or in an effort to have a relationship with them. That's what I realized I was doing with my dad is he had died and I was just livid, livid. Let's just keep going with the more questions. I want to answer as many questions as I can. Um, so um, livid. And I realized with the help of a therapist that I was keeping him alive so I could fix him. Doesn't work that way. Little, little interior child me thought it did. So I had to work on my inner child and I had to fix myself. It's not about them. It's about us. So you let go of the anger and you work on you. Do you have a right to your anger? Absolutely. Get a punching bag, write it out, do what you need to, but let it go. Acknowledge it, let it go. When we resist something is when it stays. When we go, no, 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 no. I don't want to feel this. I don't want to feel this. I don't, I don't want to. What am I feeling the whole time? That very emotion that I'm trying to resist. 
So you got to work on it. And you got to realize that they don't deserve to be in your head. They don't deserve you. They don't deserve you. They've treated you like crap. They showed you who they were. Let them go. Boom. Done. Now, if it is a situation where it is a target of abuse that has become the abuser, abuse by proxy, if they leave the abuser and if they get into therapy, then you can consider letting them back in, but only if they are in therapy and only if they are willing to go to therapy with the family and the friends that they've harmed. If they're not, be done. Be done. Okay. Um, blah, 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 blah. Where'd I go? Um, okay. I've been reading about attachment styles and I recognize myself as fearful avoidant. Is the development of this attachment style due to toxic shame instilled by my narcissistic parents? Yes, absolutely. It absolutely is. Our attachment styles come from our parents. That's where we learn attachment. If we've got a secure attachment, it's healthy, it's normal, it's, you know, easy. It's like, oh, I'm safe, I'm okay, everything's fine. There's no anxiety, there's no depression, there's no nothing because you know you're okay. You're going to be taken care of. There's food, there's shelter, there's clothing, etc. If, however, you had abusive, neglectful, harmful parents, you're going to have either an avoidant style of attachment, fearful, you know, avoiding, 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 because you don't want to get hurt, or you're going to be, you know, overly enmeshed, or you're going to be like, you know, just, you know, to the point where you're like isolated and don't want human contact at all, period. So there's a whole bunch of different attachment styles. The good news of it is, is it's never too late to have a happy childhood. By hanging around people that have healthy attachments, it rubs off on us and we learn how to behave, how to have a healthy relationship. So you want to surround yourself with healthy people. And it does rub off on us. So uh, Psychology Today did an article, and I talked about this a few months ago. It was about attachment styles. So go look up, go to Psychology Today, type in psychologytoday.com, go to uh, the little uh, uh, search bar, put in attachment styles, and it will have a ton of articles on it. And it talks about how it can be helped with therapy, with um, hanging around healthy people, you know, getting with a healthy partner, that kind of thing. It rubs off on us. It absolutely does. Okay. Um, I have an anxious attachment style and I'm extremely needy. I know deep down my relationship is toxic. There are domestic violence. There has been domestic violence and my partner shames me and makes me feel insecure. What should I do? I cannot tell you what to do. However, I think you already know what the answer is. You don't like it. So healthy, normal people, and I say normal in bunny ears, do not hang out with abusers. They do not stay in an abusive relationship. They do not put up with abuse. So I would suggest very strongly getting a safety plan together, get with a damn good therapist, start working on self-esteem, the disease to please by Harriet Breaker, a self-esteem workbook by Glenn Schiraldi, and uh, start thinking about that you deserve better. Okay. Um, okay. Question. I feel like I can't completely move on because I feel guilty because my BPD ex has abandonment issues since I ended all contact. How do I stop the guilt? Okay. So this is what happens. When somebody has an abandonment issue, they will make you the bad guy. They absolutely will. And they will say, you know, if you really loved me, you would have stuck around. What they are conveniently forgetting is healthy people do not stick around to be somebody else's punching bag. Period. You don't. So if they did not want to be abandoned, they should not have been using you as a punching bag. Getting rid of the guilt, you acknowledge that. Do you deserve to be abused? Are you done? Oh, you don't deserve to be abused and you're done? Well, guess what? You did the right thing. So, you know, you can't, if the guilt pops up, that's a manipulation, either learned in childhood, excuse me, or learned from this relationship. And you write a letter to the guilt. Dear guilt, I refuse. I refuse to go on a guilt trip. You know what? The room service sucks and I'm not doing it. Have a nice day. And you realize I don't deserve to be treated like that. I don't. I don't deserve to be treated like that. If, if you wanted me to stick around, you probably shouldn't have been abusive. Period. You put it back on them. You put it back on them. Remember how I was talking about the shame, the guilt, the fear, the obligation? You put it back on the abuser. Chapter three, CPTSD from surviving to thriving. Get it. Listen to it. Read it. Do it. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, blah, 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 blah. Where am I? Um, I am working on EMDR, but can't get to my inner feelings. It's like the anger distracted part of me is too much. 
How can I dig deeper within myself? So this, quite frankly, is why I got a punching bag. Because within about, oh, I don't know, five minutes of punching the punching bag, I suddenly accessed the softer emotions and was sobbing on my knees like a baby. So we are physical human beings. And when we're little kids, everything's physical. You know, you, you tell a kid something, they'll go out and play really hard and then come back and then work on it and then go out and play really hard. So get a punching bag or write it out. What is your anger about? If your anger had a voice, what would it say? Who is it mad at, really? Not, not the bullshit, but who is it mad at, really? And write it out. So you want to get to the softer emotions, so get a punching bag, wail on that bitch, and you will find that the softer emotions will eventually come out. And just be aware of what are you thinking and what are you feeling as you are punching the punching bag. What's going on? What are you thinking? What are you feeling? Where do you feel it? Where is the anger coming from? What is the distraction about? Who doesn't want you to be focused? Write it out. Punch it out. Write it out. Do it. Okay. Do you have any advice for parents that have young kiddos that are showing signs of anxiety? Teach them breathing. Breathing. Now, anxiety is a learned behavior. They learn it from watching anxious parents. So my suggestion would be go to yoga with them. Teach them how to meditate with you. Get onto YouTube. There's a whole bunch of breathing exercises that are nice. Some of them are a little funky. Some of them got really distracting music and things like that. Others are just breathing. It's like, okay, breath in and out. Self-soothe and breath in and out. Do you see where I'm going? It's like find some breathing stuff. So if the kids are getting anxious, the question is, who are they learning it from? And if it's you, then you got to work on it yourself. Kids do not just pop out of the womb with all of these issues. It's a learned behavior. So teach them how to breathe. Anxiety, again, is caused from the amygdala, okay, left side, right side. This little guy's stupid, cannot tell the difference between a thought or reality, okay? So when we get anxious, what's the first thing we do? Hold our breath. And we stop taking full, deep breaths. And pretty soon, another part of the brain goes, oh, my God, we're going to die. It releases adrenaline, racing thoughts, racing thoughts, pounding heart, pounding heart. And the best way to short circuit that whole thing is breathing and self-soothing talk. I'm safe. I'm okay. Everything's fine. You're safe. You're okay. Everything's fine. It's all good. That kind of thing. So get your kids into meditation or yoga. Figure out where your anxiety is. Are you teaching them this? Or is it coming from an ex, you know, an abusive ex, you know, because exes are, you know, the abusive exes are often very anxious to the point of like OCD kind of thing. So um, figure it out. Where is this coming from? Um, is it common for people to gaslight you and target you as a shame of form of control? We already answered that one. Why did this go back? What is going on? Um, all right. Uh, I think, oh, wait. Uh, have you heard of a PTSD panic attack happening and giving birth? I literally had a cinema screen of my abuse that stalled my labor in the process of, give, of having my first child. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. So yeah, it, PTSD happens at the weirdest time. It's, it's like the shame and which is part of PTSD as well. The shame and the PTSD will come out at the most bizarre times. You know, it's like you'll be bebopping along and all of a sudden you'll find yourself sabotaging yourself with the shame. You'll be bebopping along middle of labor and all of a sudden you've got a screen in front of you replaying all of the abuse and all of this and all of that as you're in the middle of labor. Yeah, that is part of PTSD. Absolutely. Um, hope that answered the question. So um, if you have questions on PTSD or complex post-traumatic stress disorder, go to the Mayo Clinic, just type in Mayo Clinic PTSD. It will talk about signs, symptoms, what to do, et cetera, et cetera. Um, is it possible to form a healthy attachment to a therapist if we've had non-healthy attachments to parents? Is this risky? If so, what can a client and therapist do about it? Oh boy. <laughs> so here's the thing. Therapists have to have really good boundaries. You know, you have to, because you don't want to blur those ethical lines, okay? You can form a healthy relationship with your therapist, and a relationship being the therapist is the therapist and you are the client, and then neither the tween shall meet, okay? Um, you can learn how to have a healthy relationship based on the boundaries that the therapist draws, okay? 
if you've had a non-healthy attachment to parents, yeah, this is part of you surrounding you with healthy people that have got good boundaries, okay? Um, you do not want to push those boundaries. And oftentimes what I see in clients when they've had attachment issues is that they try to push those boundaries. And the therapist, if they're good, is going to keep those boundaries rock fucking solid. So yeah, it's good because you learn the word no and you learn what a good boundary is and um, you recognize when you're trying to push it. And if your therapist is really good, they're going to bring it up. They're going to be like, okay, this is what I see happening. What do you feel about it? Let's talk about it. Okay. And you don't want to avoid it. And oftentimes clients are embarrassed or they're um, afraid to, to bring it up. You know, it's transference is what it is. They're just transferring what they went through in childhood onto the therapist and the therapist is there to deal with it. That is our job. So you want to talk to your therapist about that. Uh, uh, is there a different approach to self-esteem work for those of us with a traumatic brain injury? Yes. Okay. So with TBIs, there's going to be a lot of stuff going on. There could be memory loss going on. There could be a personality change going on. I've seen that as well. You're going to want to get with probably, my guess is, a psychiatrist, medical doctor that understands traumatic brain in in industries, no, injuries, and can help you figure out a way to process information differently. So when there is a traumatic brain injury, we sometimes have to work through things in a different manner in order to get it to stick. So my suggestion for that would be get with a doctor, like a, a psychiatrist, somebody who actually does talk therapy, not just write scripts, because that's unfortunately what a lot of psychiatrists have turned into, that can help you visualize and understand what's going on with your brain and they should be in close contact with your uh, neurologist. Absolutely. Ask your neurologist for a referral because you need somebody who understands traumatic brain injuries. Absolutely. And how the brain rewires and what you need to do to retain information and what you need to do to work on self-esteem. Absolutely. Woo! That was a lot of questions, guys. Okay. So to recap, toxic shame, not yours. They shame us about everything. They shame us about our body. They shame us about money. They shame us about who we are. They go for the jugular. They make us wrong about everything. Take that shame and that anger, put it back onto the abuser. Read CPTSD from Surviving to Thriving by Pete Walker. Get the audio version. Listen to that first. Then do the workbook. So you do chapter one here, chapter one there, chapter two here, chapter two there. That often helps. If you are truly stuck, tell your therapist, I'm stuck. I can't even open the book. Great. Bring it in. Let's work on it. Okay. Um, <laughs> all right. I think that is it. So uh, remember, if you're interested in going to Reno, those tickets are going fast. There are a few left, not very many. Uh, also, the next one after that is going to be San Antonio and uh, Austin. Very much looking forward to that. That will be my only Texas visit. So if you are live this year anyway, if you're interested in going to that, go sign up at eventbrite.com, Mercury Eventbrite. Um, okay. Let me see what else. Uh, cruise is coming up. We can still get cabins. If you're interested, contact Chris at mercury.com. Um, merchandise, uh, the merchant store is up. If you're interested in buying coffee mugs or t-shirts or anything, go there. I cannot think of anything else. All right, guys, go have a really amazing week. Be good to yourselves. Take care of yourselves. Do self care so that you are living a life that you do not have to escape from. That is the best advice I can give you. All right, kids, have a great day. I will talk to you as soon as I find my cursor. There it is. Okay, later. Bye.